Dana Reed just received her first Emmy nomination for directing The Handmaid's Tale, season two, episode Holly. I'm Kevin Jacobson, writer at Gold Derby, here with Dana herself. So, hi. hi. <laughs> so, Dana, what was your reaction just to hearing that you had gotten nominated for an Emmy? No, I, well, I woke up because I'm in Australia. And there was a message from uh, an associate of mine saying, congratulations. I'm like, for what? So then I opened up my, um, my emails and there were like 40 emails. So it was, it was very surprising to wake up to that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I know uh, Holly was your first episode you directed of The Handmaid's Tale. So what was it that actually brought you to the show and like, how did you get involved? Well, look, I, I kind of, you know, decided to take the adventure over to the US and, you know, meet all the people there because I've been working in Australia for a long time now. And, uh, um, and I, I met with the people at Hulu and I, I'm not really sure how it all worked, uh, but I remember I got a call and I had a, a phone interview with, you know, with the wonderful Bruce and, and Warren Littlefield and Elizabeth Moss and after we had a chat on the phone, I was on the plane and on the way over. Um, so this episode, when you have the script, it has these present day scenes and the flashbacks to June's life as a mother before Gilead. So uh, what was your vision for just how to bring together these two points in June's life and especially that cross cutting between June giving birth to Holly in the present and then also Hannah in the past? Well, what's really interesting and wonderful about that script and what we did, you know, what Elizabeth and I kind of worked on uh, and with with Bruce Miller as well is, you know, being in Gilead is the worst thing ever. But when we look back at what happened back when she was having Hannah, she is unbelievably afraid. As you know, all of us are. Look, you know, I remember, you know, having having my kids. It's a very scary, confronting business. And you know, one of the things that you know that that June in the past is saying is, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't think I can do it. And yet here she is in Gilead in the worst of all possible situations that you do not want to be in. And it has brought her the most incredible bravery and courage that she possibly never knew she had. The situation that she's in has created, well, as we've seen in you know, uh, season three, has created this new person who can do that. I mean, the idea of doing that by yourself out in the middle of nowhere, okay, so she's got a lovely house to do it in, but you know, heating's probably not on. And you know, she, Fights fire, so lucky. But um, you know, it's it's the most horrifying, confronting, terrifying thing ever, and she masters it. You know, and, and that's what when you know, Elizabeth and I were kind of mining into what do you draw upon? Because hardly any of us will be faced with anything that horrifying. Hopefully, in our existence, um, a lot of people will, but hopefully we don't. And you know, what do you draw upon to get to get that result? Right. And this episode has a lot of different elements happening where it's all in one location at the mansion. There's these large sections where it's just June in survival mode, basically trying to escape. There's also this big marital spat between Serena and Fred. There's flashbacks to June giving birth, as I said, and there's giving birth in the present. There's this black wolf that shows up, which feels very symbolic. So a lot going on. But what did you find to be just the most difficult aspect of directing this episode i've said this before i open up repeating myself but yeah just how cold it was as an australian who's never experienced that before that was that was the real challenge like that was just me realizing that the jacket i'd bought from australia just wasn't right just I, 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 that was such an amazing shock so yeah but then i you know as i say I look at Elizabeth Moss and she's wearing a handmaid's outfit and she's rolling around in the snow. So I just went, get over it and forget about it. And even though you're convulsing with the cold and just do it. So um, it was, you know, because I was, I was very nervous, understandably, because it was my first, um, my first job away from home. But yeah, then to be going, and it's going to be, or we say 20 below, but whatever, you know, in America, in the Fahrenheit system, it's you know, a million below. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, so that was that was tough. But everything else was just such an unbelievably exciting 
opportunity, everything, every other aspect of it was so incredibly exciting. Um, you know, working with Yvonne and uh, Joseph uh, on that incredible scene where they come in and their gloves are off and they are in private like we've never seen them and they can really let rip the two of them. And I think they, the actors both, uh, you know, reveled in that opportunity to go right, the, all the Gilead stuff's off. So, and even to work with the wolf, who was a, really a puppy, so very, very playful, <laughs> very happy to be around, but having to be sinister. Um, yeah, so all that stuff was fun. Yeah. Um, so there's also this moment where June is at the mansion. She finds the key to a car. She turns it on, listens to the radio. We have an announcer giving an update on what's happening in the world. And it just so happens to be the voice of Oprah Winfrey. So, I mean, how exactly did that whole that whole thing come about? Just the casting of Oprah Winfrey? Oh, we were just, you know, we were in the meeting. We are just tossing ideas around. And um, you know, it's that funny thing. We, I say, oh, the, the DJs will, will be a woman. And they all kind of went, oh, yes, of course, of course, where it's not Gilead. Because, you know, there's that thing of, in Gilead, like, you know, our world, but <laughs> there's a lot of the jobs are held by blokes. All the jobs are held by blokes. And then, so in in um, in New America, Little America, uh, you know, back to, you know, women being able to have jobs. So let's have the DJ be a woman. And from that, I just love that they were off. And it's like, so let's get, you know, probably, well, arguably one of the most famous women in the world <laughs> to do it so um and apparently oprah used to do radio stuff you know at other times in her career so you can really hear that her click into that that person that she she was when her radio voice was you know it was fantastic it was just quite uplifting yeah, it's pretty brilliant. Um, can you talk a little more about your experience of just working with Elizabeth Moss in particular in this episode? Because like she really goes through the ringer here, and I feel like you can even see that on screen. Oh, she is such a wonderful, brave, you know, energetic. I can't. I think of more you know, adjectives to describe it. Um, the most incredible well, actor and person, and so I think she's. She's excited by that challenge. I think she she loves those opportunities. And really, I mean, she never really met me before. So it's just working on gaining that trust and you know, for her to know that I'm there for her. Um, they're gonna, I'm gonna look after her. We're gonna you know, mine the depths of, of this together. Um, so she was really very, very trusting. And so we kind of you know, metaphorically held hands and kind of jumped in. Uh, and you know, she's, she just brings, she'll bring you know, what we've talked about and then she'll always support you. And so from that, she'll bring new things each take. And, and she's, you know, she was really quite formidable for you know, an, an actor so young. Mm -hmm. And you also got to work with Cherry Jones, who is a previous Emmy winner and Tony winner. She got another Emmy nomination and guest actress this year for this particular episode, actually. Uh, so just what was it like working with Cherry, just someone on her caliber? So this is embarrassing for me, but I remember watching Cherry and Signs. Um, I'm a big genre. Fan. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, that woman is so authentic. They must have got a real cop to do that. <laughs> you know, the thing going, I'm not, you know, I'm not in uh, you know, America to go to all those Broadway shows to actually know <laughs> that she's a superstar. And I'm like, she's so authentic and, and incredible. And to watch that process, obviously, very soon after that, someone said, idiot, you know, <laughs> have a look at this. <laughs> so, um, uh, so to, to get to, I mean, just to get to watch that was really quite incredible because again you know she just she just bring it i mean i had the most incredible respect for actors um and she is well, i always say touched by god you know, there's a lot of you know actors who are touched by god and pretty much you know, everyone on the show is they're all the most incredible performers who channel different things but when you see someone who's been doing it for so long at the absolute top 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 of this skill it really is quite awe inspiring yeah absolutely really nice loveliest person 
<laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, well, you also directed the season three episode of The Handmaid's Tale called Heroic, where June is being punished by being confined to Natalie's hospital, and she's starting to sort of lose her grip on reality. And once again, it all takes place in one general location. So uh, do you like doing these kinds of almost like bottle episodes that are just confined to this one location? I guess, I mean, you know, um, yeah, I, I've done lots of other things as well that aren't confined to one location, but I do love that challenge. I mean, I guess, you know, I come from a, a theatre background, um, so in a sense you've got, it's a stage, you know, it's, it, we're, we're in that, that, that space and we have to create all that world in that space and it's a, it's a great challenge to do that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I love that going, oh, okay, so our lead character is praying and the other character in the room is in a coma. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. And then, you know, kind of building and creating. And again, you know, going on that journey with Elizabeth Moss, once again, we, you know, we kind of hold hands and jump in and, um, and explore, you know, even, even more stuff of what, yeah, you know, what a human is capable of when put into this this situation. Yeah, you know, we we likened it to you know, forty days, forty nights in the desert. You know, that's sort of what happens when you go into this. Yeah, you know, there was so much forward momentum, and then suddenly, bang, you're stopped. You know, she's she's on this trajectory, and she's now held, and what that does to a character, mm -hmm. or an act. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. Uh, so you've you've directed four episodes of The Handmaid's Tale now so far, so you've certainly, I think, had a hand in shaping what the series has looked like after season one, where we're no longer following the plot of Margaret Atwood's book. Uh, we're, we've certainly gone through a lot with the character of June, but I'm curious how far you see the show going. You know, I know you're not in the writer's room, but just how much further you think the show can explore with June and Gilead and this dystopian world from here? Well, the interesting thing about, you know, I read The Handmaid's Tale a long time ago. Um, and of course I reread it um, when I became involved in the, uh, in the project. But, you know, we have that moment at the end of the book where we're actually in Australia and, uh, and they're breaking down what happened in Gilead. So to, it's kind of like there's untold possibilities to get to that place, which the tone of that place is still not ideal, strangely enough. You know, and so what the, you've got to think, well, what has the world become? And I think, you know, and I'm sure Margaret Atwood would be in agreement with this, is that we can look at the world that we're in now. And go, okay, that was that. We're going through this. There's the end of the book. And the possibilities between those places and those places are endless. We can, we could go anywhere with that. Um, what we know is that, you know, obviously, well, see, this might be my optimistic self. I always assumed that those tapes, those recordings, the musings of, of June, she was out. Let's hope that's actually real. I mean, and of course, because we say, you know, in, at the end of the book that Korea is a thing of the past. But, um, yeah, I think they could go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, well, you've done quite a bit of TV directing over the past decade and other kinds of directing as well. Is there something special just about the set of The Handmaid's Tale that just sticks out for you compared to other shows? Yeah, because, again, I'm, I'm, not that The Handmaid's is not just genre, but it is speculative fiction, of which I am a massive fan. I mean, it, that was one of the things that sent me... Um, out of Australia into uh, the United States for work, North America for work, because there was more genre stuff being done. Um, so there's a little bit of nerd in me. And for me to be walking down the street with the handmaids walking past and the G-Wagon zooming past and the, you know, the guardians, woo woo, with their cars go past, and to actually be in it really appears, feels to the kid in me, like to go, it's like virtual but actual reality to be in you know, one of my favourite, you know, speculative fiction genres, one of my favourite books is um, is a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then Reed Morano actually won the Emmy back in 2017 for directing the first episode of The Handmaid's Tale, and she really, I think, helped 
establish the look and feel and tone of the series. And I think honestly kind of helped turn it into the cultural phenomenon that it sort of became. And the show I think has really tried to replicate that tone ever since. So what do you think it is about that initial vision that really just captured people and brought this story to life? I think, you know, with the, the lighting, her background as a DOP, she brought such a beautiful aesthetic to it, which I think, you know, just seduces you as a viewer because it's beautiful, because the house is beautiful, the lighting is heavenly. You know, it's, we always say it's always sunny in Gilead. You know, it's, that, but it's, um, it's idyllic and yet it's horrific. And I'm, look, it, so those two things kind of there's a comfort in going into that Waterford house, in the house. You kind of, there's something that we all go, oh, I, I, oh my, my fantasy wants to be in that lounge room, except what's actually happening is so, so, so very awful. So I think that that lovely pull of what we visually open up to us. I mean, you know, Gilead itself, when you walk outside the house, is very totalitarian and dark and awful. And the other... So you get that as well, going, oh, that is the other, but at home I'm it's kind of it's kind of lovely, it's kind of a dream. But the reality is so awful. So I think I think as viewers we love being pulled in all those directions. Absolutely. And just going back to your awards, you were also nominated for directing this episode earlier this year by the Directors Guild of America. So what is recognition like that, just like from your peers, your fellow directors? What does that sort of thing mean for you? Oh, you, know, you just can't believe it. You kind of go, oh, I made the right decision doing this. Because <laughs> um, I used to be an actor and I swapped over. And, and uh, you, you go, oh, that was, that was definitely the right thing to do when that happens. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dana. And best of luck for you at, at this year's Emmys. I'm looking forward to it. Lovely That's to sweet. talk. Yes. For everyone else, please hit like and subscribe for more Emmy season interviews and head to goldderby.com and make your predictions.